Parameter sweeps. Parameter sweeps are probably the most powerful tool you will have in your simulation arsenal. So here we're just looking at some kind of device and up to now we've discussed simulating it at a single frequency or a single wavelength. Well, what if we wanted to study this device and how it responds as a function of wavelength? So we would like to maybe calculate transmission and reflection over a whole span of wavelengths. Or maybe we want to plot the reflection and transmission as we change the height of the tooth on this diffraction grating. We keep wavelength fixed and sweep the height of this tooth. Well, when we do that, we come up with what we call a parameter sweep. So along the horizontal axis is the parameter that you're sweeping. And very often, I would say most often, this is frequency or wavelength. Those are somewhat interchangeable. But it could also be the dimension of a device, a refractive index, permittivity, something else. And then we're plotting the device response as a function of this parameter as it's being changed. And so the ability to do this is an incredibly powerful tool, but it requires a slight modification to our transfer matrix method. And I am discussing this lecture in the context of the transfer matrix method, but really what we're talking about could apply to any numerical method. Let's draw some block diagrams of how we would do some of the more common parameter sweeps. We'll start off with a block diagram, a high level block diagram, when we don't do any kind of parameter sweep. We'll have a dashboard that defines all of our hard coded numbers. So it's source parameters, refractive indices, device dimensions, permittivity, stuff like that. Then we go in, we might want to compute some preliminary parameters, wave vector components, other things. Then we'll build the device. So in the transfer matrix method, that's putting the permittivity, permeability, and thickness in those three different arrays. We'll perform the simulation and then show the results in some way. So at a high level, that's our block diagram. And really we could put that block diagram to any numerical method you'll learn in this course. So the most common parameter sweep is a wavelength or frequency sweep, or maybe we're plotting reflection and transmission as a function of wavelength in this case. So the block diagram remains much the same, except we wrap, wrap a loop around some of it. So we'll still have our dashboard. We'll still maybe compute some intermediate parameters. We'll build our device. We don't need to build the device inside of this loop because the device doesn't change. Now, once we're inside the loop, we will select a new wavelength. We will perform our new simulation. Since we're doing a sweep here, we probably want to record those results so that we can plot them later. Maybe we're even plotting them as they go. And when the sweep is done, we exit that loop and then we can start post-processing, plotting, dressing up our graphics and, and learning from what we've done. Another type of sweep is maybe we're changing some kind of parameter about the device. So maybe the height of a grading tooth and we're looking at reflection and transmission as a function of that. So we'll still have our dashboard. We still may want to compute some intermediate stuff before we enter the main loop, but now we enter the main loop. And so we're looping over this parameter that we want to vary. So the very first thing we'll do is figure out, okay, what's the current parameter? Now we're going to build the device. Notice we've moved the build device step into this loop. That's because the device is different at each iteration. So we set our parameter, we build the device, and then perform the simulation, record our results, show the results. When all this is done, we can plot and learn. Another sweep that's very common and really should become standard practice, but we don't often see these because we just assume that they're done, is something called a convergent sweep. This does not apply too much to transfer matrix method, but in later methods, we're going to have resolution parameters where we can make our simulation more and more accurate. However, it will also take longer to simulate, require more memory, and we try to find the sweet spot in between where our simulations are still a little bit fast, but still accurate enough. But anytime we do that, we want to plot our results as a function of this resolution parameter. And what we would like to see is our answers converge, kind of reach an asymptote as we're cranking up our resolution. However, this forces us to do absolutely everything in the loop because it all depends on that resolution. 
So we have our dashboard where we define everything, but at that point we have to enter our loop. We set the resolution of our simulation. We will compute intermediate parameters, build our device, perform the sim, record the results, and show the results. So convergence sweep is the biggest loop. And when that's done, we can look at that and we can figure out where we want to operate in terms of resolution. In transfer matrix method, there isn't really a resolution parameter, but this is something we'll run into later. So you can notice a theme. These are still really the basic steps of the high level algorithm. It's just a matter of what we move in the loop and out of the loop. We would like to calculate as much stuff as possible outside of the loop so that we don't slow down our parameter sweep. So we just move everything inside the loop that may be changing as we're doing that sweep. And I'll mention one other thing, uh, showing the results while you're simulating. I think this is extremely good practice. Transfer matrix method is so fast, you really won't feel the pain of this, but when you get to other methods and we move into more dimensions like two and three, they become much slower. A parameter sweep could take a day or two. I don't think it makes much sense to wait that entire day or two before looking at your intermediate results or your preliminary results. Suppose the first two points, you could tell right away something's going wrong with the simulation and you should stop it, fix it, and then rerun it. If you don't look at your results as you're doing the sweep, you can't see that. So I strongly recommend showing your results. Now graphics does slow things down. So if you have a fast simulation, but maybe you're doing 10,000 points, what you probably want to do is maybe only update your results every 100 points, or maybe you time it and only update your graphics every 30 seconds or something like that. But either way, I really recommend showing those intermediate results so that you can capture things going wrong before you've wasted too much time. Another suggestion is make a generic function for your numerical algorithm. Here we'll talk about making a generic function for the transfer matrix method. And why are we doing this? Because this really cleans up your code. Instead of taking your, your big long transfer matrix method code and putting a loop around that, well, we just have this small little loop with a call to the transfer matrix method right in the middle of it. So to make a generic function, we have to think about what are the inputs and what are the outputs. Well, the inputs, we have to define things about our source. So that is wavelength. We have our angle of incidence. We have our polarization. Maybe there's other things. Maybe you want to control the amplitude of your source and not just force it to be one. There might be other things that you're interested in. In terms of the device, you'll have to tell it the permeability, permittivity, and thickness of each layer. Maybe there's other things. Maybe you're accounting for dispersion and you have to fit material models. But for the most part, these parameters are what you'll need. And then the outputs is reflectance and transmittance. You might be interested in some intermediate parameters. Maybe you're interested in the reflection and transmission coefficient, which is what we had before we took the magnitude and squared it to calculate reflectance and transmittance. I also recommend making a header for your generic function. Here's how I did it for the transfer matrix method. So I'm calling this function TMM1D, just to remind myself this is a one dimensional transfer matrix method. And I'm using a type of data structure in MATLAB called a structure. And I'm using two of them, dev to describe everything about the device and source to describe everything about the source. So at the very top of this, I have my the name of the code, uh, kind of a long version of the name so we know what it is. And then I like to include this command of how to call it because I can copy and paste that into my code and I know how to call the transfer matrix method. Now in our structure, we have several different fields. So this is a way really of lumping here's like seven variables into one and then we can just treat it as one. So we need to know the materials in the external regions. We need our three arrays describing the permittivity, permeability, and thickness of each layer. So this is everything that describes our device. Then we move on to source. We need to know the wavelength where we're performing the simulation. We need to know the angle of incidence, and we need to know the amplitude, the complex amplitude of both the TE and the TM polarizations. And then the output, we have reflectance and transmittance. And you're certainly free to add or subtract other fields to these parameters to bring more data in or more data out. And doing a header this way, if you're in MATLAB, you can simply type help TMM1D 
and up pops all this and you'll remember how to use your function because if you write it a month from now you may not remember so here's the outline that we had for our transfer matrix method before we wrote the block diagram this is what we had we had a bunch of steps and step six was our main loop which calculated p q eigenmodes computed the layer scattering matrix updated the global scattering matrix so the question is which of these steps is what we lump into transfer matrix method 1d well this is it what we don't want inside of our tmm 1d function we don't want to define anything about the problem remember we're making a generic function that should be able to simulate everything so if we're defining anything about the problem inside there that doesn't make any sense so clearly anything about that dashboard or building the device building those three arrays that define your permittivity permeability thickness that all needs to be outside of this function because we want our function to be able to simulate everything well from that point forward everything gets lumped into the tmm 1d except it's going to hand back reflectance and transmittance and doing things like verifying conservation of power that's a job for outside of this function where we add transmittance reflectance make sure we get one unless of course we have loss or gain a little bit more about wavelength or parameter sweep so here's our block diagram to the right and we build our layers the same way no surprise here but here's what the loop would actually look like if we design this or write this generic tmm 1d function we set up a loop to go over wavelength so this little n lamb that's going to be the index of the wavelength we're simulating it's going to go one two three four five and the first thing we'll do is go into an array lambda where we've calculated all the different wavelengths across our sweep so this array is going to go from 400 up to 700 probably nanometers and so for each one of those we will set our source wavelength to that wavelength outside of this we've already defined our device and probably our other source parameters that happened before the loop so inside the loop all we have to do is update the wavelength call tmm 1d and then record in this array ref record the reflectance we might also want to record the transmittance but then when we're done we can plot it and there we go that is a very very simple loop and that's why we want this generic tmm 1d function imagine how ugly that would be if instead of this one call to tmm 1d you had to stick your code in there and your code's probably going to be 30 to 40 lines it just it would not look pretty so the generic function is the way to go not only for transfer matrix method but pretty much any other method i've ever written i've done that for another type of parameter sweep is one where maybe we're sweeping wavelength or frequency and we want to incorporate dispersion now before when we showed this loop we did not have build device inside the loop however what dispersion is means your material properties are changing as a function of wavelength when that happens we do actually want to bring the build steps inside this loop so we have a loop over wavelength in this case so given whatever wavelength we're doing here we're going to determine what our permeability and permittivity is some people use Lorentz models Drude models other things to calculate permittivity and permeability given those we can build our device again build those three arrays defining permittivity permeability and thicknesses and then the rest is pretty much the same set the wavelength perform the simulation record the results and show the results but when we're incorporating dispersion i wanted to mention we do actually have to build the device inside the loop simply because the material properties are changing now let's look at the difference between good and bad parameter sweep so we are looking at a parameter sweep that somebody plotted from matlab and this is bad there's a lot of bad things about this let's go through them one at a time first thing is what's the conservation of power look like i always like to plot a third line where i add the red and blue lines the red will be reflectance blue will be transmittance and i add them together and i am looking for a line going flat all the way across that's my conservation of power and of course if there's loss or gain in my simulation that curve would not be flat but with that off it should be flat and it's an awesome check to make sure everything's right with your simulation so there is no conservation line we need that what else is wrong with this 
Well, there's a lot of wasted white space. Why is this white space here? We don't need that. Well, maybe you intend to insert an inset of, of the picture of the device, and that's okay. You know, that might look good right here. But if that's not your intent, don't have any of this white space. This is all wasted. Get rid of that. The font size. I'm not sure you can read that font or not. I sort of intended for you not to be able to read it, but that's way too small. We need to make sure that those fonts are big. And in the final size, your fonts need to be 10, 12, 14 point font, but really no smaller than 10 or you're risking people not being able to read, the, read your diagrams. Another thing is scale. So we just have a bunch of numbers here, but all of a sudden we have this, this weird times 10 to the minus 6. We should get rid of that and then just call this, this scale maybe microns, micrometers, or something like that. So don't have your scale represented that way. That's very amateurish. Let's think about the number of digits. This is actually particularly important for the vertical axis, but here we have two digits, one digit, two digit, two digit, two digit, back to one digit. And that inconsistency will take people just a few extra moments to digest what's going on. And I think it's even more important on the vertical axis because we have this one and then a one, but your eyes have to go over and you know maybe your eyes might mistake this for 1.1 because it's aligned with the 0.5. It just makes it easier to read if we're showing a consistent number of digits the whole time. So think about having a consistent number of digits. The other thing, these aren't labeled. What is that vertical axis? What is the horizontal axis? There's no labels here. Never do that. Line thicknesses. Perhaps this looks good on your computer screen. I really intended it to look very thin and not come across well at all. So think about line thicknesses. Here's another really bad sign. Whenever I look at a parameter sweep and I see these triangle polygon kind of things, what that tells me is we had a very coarse sweep and the distance between the points along the horizontal axis is just too far. There's, there's features going on in between that that we're failing to resolve. So if you see these polygon triangle kind of things in your data, you need to go back and add more points. All of these lines should look smooth. I don't know of any devices that actually have a response that looks sharp like that. It's always smooth. So use enough points along the horizontal axis so that your lines look smooth. So here's an example of what a good plot might look like. Notice everything's labeled. I have a consistent number of digits. Maybe I've crammed too many here, but we can remove some of those. But I've labeled my axes. I've given it a title. My lines are thick enough. Here's my conservation curve. Also notice I've given it a little bit of space here. I didn't put this top line right on top of my conservation curve because I might not see it. But I want this conservation curve all the time except when I'm about to publish my data or maybe give a big presentation because that just brings up questions. But always, 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 I have that line there except for that final plot that I'm putting in a publication. But uh, people, when they're reading your papers or listening to your presentations, they're going to assume that your, your method is working and it's converged. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.